Monday after Easter. I trust you had a great time yesterday celebrating our Lord's resurrection. We began at 6.45 this, uh, yesterday morning for a sunrise service on the high, one of the highest peaks, I believe, in Montgomery County in Virginia. And uh, we could see the whole region from where we were. And we had a good crowd and we had a great celebration of Jesus' resurrection. Welcome to our 14th session in our study of the Apostle Paul's great little letter to the church at Ephesus. Now before we move into our lesson for today, I want to share this announcement with you. In addition to these sessions in the study of this letter, I have also been producing two other broadcasts every week for over a year, without missing one week. All of this because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, I have been bringing the sermon every third week for the morning worship broadcast for the two churches I serve as a co-pastor. So, as you can imagine, I need a break. So I've decided to take a break from these responsibilities for the next three weeks. <clears throat> so I will not broadcast another lesson on Ephesians until the first Monday in May, which is May 3rd. I look forward to continuing our study of this book on that date. All right, let's pray together, and then we'll look at our lesson for today. Gracious Father, we pray now that your Holy Spirit will come and breathe on us. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Teach us from this passage in Ephesians, and in doing so, bring about that trans transformation of our souls that you desire for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We have been looking for several weeks at the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians found in verses 17 to 19 of the first chapter. Last week we began to examine three specifics that Paul prays for these people. We were looking at the hope of God's calling. Now our procedure in looking at that phrase, the hope of God's calling, was to take the phrase apart and examine two words separately. We looked at the word hope, and we saw that for the Christian, hope is not wishful thinking. It is not desiring something that may or may not happen. Hope for the Christian is absolute certainty. Why? Because our hope is based on the promises of God. We then went on to look at the word calling, and we noted that there are two callings of God upon us. The first calling is a general call to the whole world a call to repentance from sin and, and to put our faith in the Lord Jesus. Now this is not what Paul is referring to here in this particular prayer. There's a second calling, and the second calling is the calling God places on all believers, those who have already repented and are trusting in Christ as Lord of their lives. This is a calling to live for the praise of His glory. It is the theme of this letter. Now we covered what that phrase meant in a previous lesson, but we have not covered, so I will not broadcast another lesson on Ephesians until the first Monday in May, which is May 3rd. I look forward to continuing our study of this book on that date. All right, let's pray together, and then we'll look at our lesson for today. Gracious Father, we pray now that your Holy Spirit will come and breathe on us. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Teach us from this passage in Ephesians, and in doing so, bring about that trans transformation of our souls that you desire for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We have been looking for several weeks at the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians found in verses 17 to 19 of the first chapter. Last week we began to examine three specifics that Paul prays for these people. We were looking at the hope of God's calling. Now our procedure in looking at that phrase, the hope of God's calling, was to take the phrase apart and examine two words separately. We looked at the word hope and we saw that for the Christian, hope is not wishful thinking, 
It is not desiring something that may or may not happen. Hope for the Christian is absolute certainty. Why? Because our hope is based on the promises of God. We then went on to look at the word calling, and we noted that there are two callings of God upon us. The first calling is a general call to the whole world, a call to repentance from sin and, and to put our faith in the Lord Jesus. Now this is not what Paul is referring to here in this particular prayer. There's a second calling, and the second calling is the calling God places on all believers, those who have already repented and are trusting in Christ as Lord of their lives. This is a calling to live for the praise of his glory. It is the theme of this letter. Now we covered what that phrase meant in a previous lesson, but we have not covered, what we have not covered is the hope of that calling. In other words, we need to put the two words back together again, hope and calling. What is the hope of his calling? Now, I think we can be a little clearer in the translation of that phrase. We can put it like this, the hope that comes from his calling, or the hope that comes when we answer this call. I think that's the best way to put it. The New Living Translation puts it like this, the wonderful future he has promised to those he has called. I vehemently disagree with that translation for this reason. It insists that Paul is praying for something entirely in the future, perhaps even heaven. I do not believe that Paul was praying for something in the future. When he prayed that the, yet, that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, he was praying for something to happen to us in the present. And when he prayed that we might know the hope of his calling, he was praying that something would happen in the present in this life. Now I am justified in that position, I believe, because of chapter four, uh, chapters 4 through 6 of this book, which gives us instructions on how to live worthy of his calling in this life. As we live such a lifestyle, we uncover the rich hope of his calling. Paul does not put the emphasis on what may happen to us in eternity in this book. He is talking about the present glory of life in Christ. All right then, so what does Paul mean by the hope of his calling? Well, I would begin by saying that the hope of his calling is the hope of the knowledge of God himself. I'm not suggesting that this knowledge of God consists of knowledge about him. You and I know a lot of people who know a lot about God, but who do not know God. They are skilled in theology, the study of God. They have information about God that one can find in books and lectures. They can tell you all about the attributes of God, but they still do not know God. As I have said on many occasions, they have no experience of God. When the eyes of our hearts are enlightened, we come to know how God deals with people. We discover how his love for us shapes his work in us. We see how his love for the world shapes his guidance in our lives so that we might be better instruments for his kingdom. And that we cannot find in a theological classroom or a theological textbook. Take the Apostle Paul himself as a primary, primary example of what I am saying. As you undoubtedly know, Paul was a great theologian. He had studied under one of the greatest teachers Israel had ever known a man whose name was Gamaliel. And there are many who believe that Paul would have become a teacher to take Gamaliel's place after he died. But if ever there was a man who was disqualified to teach theology, it was the Apostle Paul, before he became an apostle, that is. Why? Well, because his knowledge and his teaching lacked redemptive qualities. He could hear his theology, memorize his theology, and understand it all, and yet supervise the unjust execution of a righteous man like Stephen and not be bothered by that. He would rush into the home of Christians and drag them off to prison and demand a death sentence for them. How far off Paul was with his advanced theological education. But on the road to Damascus, 
Paul experienced God. Or I should say, he began to experience God in a way that brought hope to him. <clears throat> Whatever Paul may have learned about God in the classroom, sitting under the feet of Gamaliel, could never compare with what Paul learned about God with his encounter with God, with his surrender to God, with his obedience to God, with guidance from God, and with the love and power of God flowing through his life. Would you say that Paul became wise in the knowledge of God as a result of the freedom he had given God to do what he willed in Paul's life? Absolutely. Isn't that the primary meaning of the word know in the Bible? An intimate knowledge? It's used in that way in marriage, isn't it? Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and brought forth a son. An intimate, personal knowledge. And that is what God is looking for with us as well. That we may know him intimately. That is the part of the hope of his calling. All right, let's take this, all of this a bit further. In the study of theology, we can talk about the love of God or the power of God, the wisdom of God, the faithfulness of God, and so forth, and come away with a limited understanding. Why? Because some things can be learned only by experience. In fact, I would go so far as to say that much of our learning that has value for us comes only by experience. You can tell a child not to touch a hot stove, but until that child has the experience of touching the hot stove, he will never understand the commandment and what motivated it. But when we are bonded together with God in vibrant relationship, when we walk in the Spirit, when we are instant in obedience, and when we are constant in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, then we will understand His love, power, wisdom, faithfulness, and his will in a way we never thought possible. Let me put it this way. All our theological learning and training merely gives us a skeleton of understanding. It is our surrender to his calling and the resulting intimate walk with him that provides the muscle and the flesh that makes the Christian faith transformative. Now that leads me to the next statement regarding the hope of our calling. And I introduce it with a question. What do you want in your spiritual journey? Let me ask it this way. What do you hope will happen in your walk with Christ? The hope of your calling will come provided what you hope for compares with what Christ hopes for in you. To live for the praise of his glory means that we will be conformed to his image. We will become like him. If that is not what you hunger for, then it will not happen. You will not find that hope. But if you hope for that, then that hope will be fulfilled in your life. Let me share with you the words from a hymn by Thomas Chisholm, written in 1797. It's an old hymn that I sang a long time ago. It's titled, Oh, to be like thee. Verse 1. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Now notice the intensity of Chisholm's language here. He's really serious about what he wants. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Is that us? Is that our hunger for him? Verse 2, O to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find? Well, we can look over that list and say, yes, we do some of those things. We have compassion, we're loving, maybe we're tender and kind. But so, many, so often, <clears throat> we don't seek the wandering sinner. 
to bring them back to Christ. Why not? Verse 3, O oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring cruel reproaches, willing to suffer others to save. Now there's a word we don't find too often in Christian vocabulary, do we? Suffer. Willing to suffer others to save. Verse 4. O oh, to be like thee, Lord, I am coming, now to receive the anointing divine, all that I am and have I am bringing. Lord, from this moment, all shall be thine. And then finally, the last verse. O oh, to be like thee while I am pleading, pour up thy spirit, fill with thy love, Make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling. Fit me for life in heaven above. Quite frequently, Paul teaches on what it means to be a temple of the Holy Spirit in our Christian walk. Make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling. Fit for thy dwelling. Qualified for thy dwelling. Fit me for life in heaven above. And then the hymn closes with this refrain. O oh, to be like thee, O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. That is the hope of our calling, that the stamp of God's own image will come deep on our hearts. It's an old hymn, isn't it? 1779 with very contemporary thoughts of true Christian discipleship. This is the hope of our calling. Now listen, when I meditate on such matters, I speak to myself just as I speak to you. Or better yet, God speaks to me as I speak to you. What extraordinary hope we have in Christ. Let's pray and surrender ourselves afresh to this astonishing calling of God upon our lives. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how easy it is to live a mediocre spiritual life. How easy it is to slip away from our resolve to walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. How easy it is to slip away and lose our passion for you. How easy it is to let sin slip in and slowly take over increase in, to increase in our lives till it engulfs us when that happens we lose our intimacy with you and the hope of our calling is not fulfilled oh father forgive us forgive us please and cleanse us help us to be sensitive super sensitive to the promptings of your spirit who constantly calls us to an intimate walk with you Help us to obey that still, small voice so that you may shape us into Christ-likeness. We believe that if we become Christ-like, then we will bear the fruit of the Spirit, just as Jesus bore the fruit of the Spirit. And we will fulfill the mission of your kingdom just as Jesus fulfilled the mission of the kingdom. We claim, Lord, the promise of 1 John 1, verse 9 right now, that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your cleansing. And now, O oh Holy Spirit, may we hear your promptings and obey them. Shape us in character, in mind, in deeds, to be like Christ our Lord, to be like him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise him. I look forward to meeting with you again on the first Monday in May. God bless you.